Thank you. I had a particularly bra broken sleep last night, a really bad sleep. I'd been asked by somebody to get up really early in the morning and take them to the airport. Um, and as often happens, I don't know if you've uh, experienced this yourself, but as often happens when I know I have to get up unusually early, I wake up every hour or so through the night. Um, and so by about five o'clock in the morning, I'd conducted a large amount of my daily worrying. Um, I call it my worry fest, and it does happen every day, sometimes for quite a lot of the day. Um, and it goes a bit like this. Traffic congestion, air pollution, climate change, insect depletion, species disappearance, poverty, in-work poverty, food poverty, fuel poverty, child poverty, plastic, pollution, recycling. What do I do with my tea bags and the compost? What can I put in the recycling? Where does it go? What about the landfill? What about the oceans? And so on, you get the idea. Um, now I've done that, I can ask you a question. And I begin by asking you what it is that you think makes us uniquely human. What makes you uniquely human? And I think that it's something called agency. To be more specific, moral agency. The power that humans have to select their values, apply their values, and make a choice about how to act. And over the next few minutes, I'd just like to tell you a few of the things that I've learned in my quest to know how to deploy my finite moral agency uh, in my life. And it's a difficult quest, and in fact, sometimes I find that I don't get very far with it. Um, to consider it, I'm going to introduce a few writers and a few thinkers and some of the people who've influenced me on my way. And of course, you have the agency to let what I say wash over you completely. You might not want to take on board anything I say. But I do hope that out of the things that you've listened to today, there will be something that helps you want to act, that helps you choose intentionally and actively to do something to build a better future. But when does the future actually begin? Well, let me introduce you to this character. This is Janus, and Janus uh, is an ancient Roman character, and as you can see, Janus faces two ways at the same time, towards the future and towards the past. And our calendar month of January, yeah, that is Janus, our character, uh, 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 calendar month of January is named after Janus at the end of one year as we look to the new. Now, on this picture, one face of Janus is light and the other is dark. And I'd like you quickly to think about whether for you, the brighter side of Janus is looking towards the future or is it looking towards the past? Because those of us who see the brighter side as the future may consider that we are optimists, but those of us who are looking the other way may see, in fact, the past as the brighter side. So, do you think you're an optimist, or do you think you're a pessimist? There's plenty in the news every day as it comes pouring into our consciousness to justify either position, actually. We could feel optimistic about magnificent, extraordinary, and inspiring inventions and achievements and discoveries. Or in fact, we could feel ourselves spiraling into despair. Uh, so either point of view is fueled. In fact, my worry fest is fueled uh, every day. Um, and here, I offer you a definition of that overwhelming sense of not knowing what to think, what to feel, where to start. And I think many people feel like this. This is written by a lady called Simone de Beauvoir, a French existentialist philosopher 
from the middle um, of the 20th century. And we'll come back um, to existentialism in a moment. What of more current thinkers? Well, here uh, is a question about optimism and pessimism. Um, and Martin Seligman is the principal proponent of uh, a relatively new branch of philosophy, uh, sorry, of psychology, positive psychology. And uh, to, to use some slightly different words, perhaps we could see that the optimist, as Martin Seligman sees it, um, sees the misfortune of humanity as easy to identify and therefore perhaps to act on. The pessimist, however, sees the misfortune of humanity as surrounding us, as part of the condition of being human. There are other uh, thinkers who talk about optimism and pessimism, of course, um, and one of them, you may have read some of his books, their current bestsellers, Noah Yuval Harari, sees things in a little bit more of a complicated way. He would say that much of what ancient peoples would have felt very helpless in the face of, things like plagues and wars uh, and, and terrible illness, um, are now within our power, are now within our power to combat. So, for example, if we can see famine on the horizon, we do have the, the mechanisms and the tools to avoid it. If there is conflict and war, we do know, and we have set up the institutions to bring that to an end and to create peace. And if we can see a disease which is likely to become a pandemic, we can apply science and we can stop it in its tracks. The question, of course, is whether we choose to do so. Whether we assume collectively that moral agency to put these terrible things to an end. And that brings us back of course, um, to agency. And I would really like to be able to find a simple framework by which to apply my own agency. Something which helps me pick the values I need and act decisively and quickly. When, I, when the worry fest kicks off or when I'm challenged by something, I would like to know what to do much more quickly than I find it easy to do. Some people are really lucky because they see life through a prism of straightforward rules that they live by. They've chosen perhaps a religion, perhaps an ideology that helps them. But for me, that's just not working. For me, that comes too close to the application of dogma, and in fact, that limits one's agency. Um, and often, it doesn't end well. So all I can do is offer to you the thoughts and the learnings that I've made as I've gone through my life. Sometimes uh, I go back to my school learning, sometimes what I learned at university, and sometimes what I've studied and read more recently. And in fact, I find it really helpful to read as much as I can because I'm still trying to work out the best way to use my moral agency. Of course, I've got values from my wonderful parents and from my great, fantastic grandma, who used to say to me, don't put it off, don't put it off, dear. Do it now. And I learned from my daughter and her, her wonderful, inspiring friends, and I learned from my nieces. So I take thoughts and insights and wisdom wherever I can find it, and I'm just gonna share a few of those things with you now. I mentioned Martin Seligman before and positive psychology, and this gives me a framework that I find useful. It's based on some core values, six values, and 24 character traits. And as I said, I find it useful. These things align with the way that I want to behave. It's not always easy. And, and they help me, as I say, when I'm grasping for something, I can call on these things. In fact, positive psychology is based on an ancient philosophy. Two and a half thousand years ago, the Stoics in ancient Greece worked up a fantastically helpful philosophy. And I call on it often. And in fact, it underpins much of the thinking that we have as part of our daily lives. So it's based on four virtues. Practical wisdom, courage, temperance, and judgment. And these four things 
help us to find our way and to apply our values. So there's some values for me to hold on to. Something else that Stoicism does, which is really helpful for me, is help me with that feeling of being totally tiny in a great big world of difficulty. What, what contribution can one person make to vastly difficult and enormous problems? And the Stoics talk about the dichotomy of control. You can only control what you can work at. So don't worry about success in the end. Control your own effort to work with integrity and care to get to where you believe is the right place. And finally, uh, the Stoics talk about humans as being es essentially social creatures. And it would, it would then follow that you would apply those values to change the future for society. Um, the existentialists I've also mentioned, and fundamentally, although some people find existentialist philosophy difficult, what they believed is that we exist, but if you merely exist, it's rather meaningless. And if you can act, then you can define the very essence of who you are. So, I've got my values, I've got my... Uh, locus of control sorted out, and I've got a call to action. That's all very well, but what am I going to work on? So as an individual, I can apply my values and my moral agency, and I can work really hard to be a better mum. doesn't always work. Keeping working at it. I can do my own work better. I can be a better teacher. I can do the right thing if I see injustice around me or if somebody drops a tenor. However, I'm with the Stoics, and I believe that we are social animals. And really, I want to use my social agency, my moral agency, to improve society, locally, nationally, internationally, if I can. Um, so, how do we have a positive effect on society? Well, here it is. Here's my worry fest. There's quite a lot of it, and in fact, that's not all of it by any means. I've picked out three of the biggies. They either are a result of or a cause of climate change. The car. The car. I got my first car probably a long time before any of you were born. And I've driven a car uh, through all those years. And I'm afraid, more recently, I've been suffering from something which a magnificent current writer called Margaret Heffernan calls willful blindness. Because I know, as I drive that car around, that I am causing pollution, I'm causing congestion, I'm contributing to increases in asthma, and I need to do something about that. So I'm going to get rid of my car. And I hope that our wonderful automotive engineers and our genius car makers will be able to help solve that problem. Now, I'm going to finish in a moment, and you'll choose what's important to you. But I offer you climate change, because I feel guilty. And Janus helps me think, don't feel guilty. There's no point in that. All you can do is act now to change the future. So, not only will I try and give up my car, but I want to call to you to think about climate change. And I want us to use uh, the climate conference in Katowice recently, COP24. The UN needs intergovernmental consensus. And whilst there was a bit of hope at that conference, there was nowhere near the decision that we needed in order to slow warming and to save the planet as we know it. So I think it's time that we stop letting our governments bask in willful blindness and that we come together individually in small ways or collectively to do something about it. So in the immortal words of my grandma, or perhaps better in the words of Simone de Beauvoir, come on, let's get on with it, let's do something. Thank you.